just going live to Facebook right now. So. Um, is that under the, the uh, Paso wine? Um, yeah, it's uh, at Paso Robles wine. All righty, there we go. We're up and running on Facebook right now. And it uh, looks like we already have attendees <laughs> over here on uh, Zoom. So Stephen Martha Hewitt, you're back again. Thank you very much for joining us from Columbus, Ohio. Drinking some Brian Benson, I see. Good on you. So we've got Mike Wilkie, Paul Maynard, Janice Pepin, somebody with a number. The Everwines, looks like. Very cool. Got some people on. All right, so we'll give it another second, everyone, and then we'll uh, we'll start uh, start the show. But we're going to let everyone have a chance to get on. I'm I'm still going to drink some wine ahead of time. Me too. Cheers. Cheers. Very cool. Let me see what's happening over on the Facebook side of things. I think we've got people over there. Excellent. Cool, cool. So I think this is the maybe the first show that we're doing in our new day and time slot, Thursdays at three o'clock. We're just waiting on a few more people to join us. Looks like we got a good crowd joining us over there on Facebook at 35 people or so. So thank you everybody over on Facebook uh, for joining us. Hopefully we'll get a few more people. This is definitely uh, less glitchy than our last show that we did last week. So that's a good thing. All right, right on. Well, let's get going. Uh, hey everyone, Chris Toronto here again from the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance for another Paso Wine Zoom Hangout. Uh, this week, we're hanging out with a few people who have their tasting rooms in the downtown. And so I thought this would make a kind of a fun show now that we're starting to see uh, some really good reopening efforts happening throughout downtown, uh, some good safe and, uh, and responsible reopening efforts, of course, uh, that it would be uh, fun to highlight a little bit of what's happening to, with, with some of our downtown uh, winery tasting rooms. So today, uh, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves real quick. We'll kind of circle back on, on our topic and kind of get into it, talk about the wines and everything else. Uh, but we have uh, Ray Smith from Indigen Cellars. I knew I was going to screw up the name Indigen, right? Is that right? No. Did I get that right? All right, cool. Close enough. Uh, Philip Crummel with Assumption Ridge Vineyards and Anita Kathari with Copia Vineyards. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, why don't I start with Ray? Uh, Ray, tell us a, just a quick little bit about yourself. And, and your brand, please. How are you guys doing? Uh, I'm Ray Smith from Indigene. Um, it's a small Carmel Valley winery. Uh, it's based in Paso Robles. I make the wines out in Carmel Valley, another part of California. Um, we make a couple of different blends and a few varietals. Most of the varietals usually have a terroir based program, meaning that you may get a Cabernet from Carmel Valley, but then you would get one from Paso Robles. The Syrahs are from two or three different areas. The Pinot Noirs are from two or three different areas. The kind of show varietal character and then how the terroir and the weather and earth will kind of change the wine uh, flavor profiles depending on where it is. So um, it's about a 1500 case winery and um, um, I love uh, the wine business. I've been in this for a long time and uh, I'm having a great time. Cheers. Cool. Cheers. Thanks for coming on. Mm. All right. Hey, Philip, uh, with Asuncion Ridge Vineyards. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the brand, please. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Philip Crummel, uh, owner and winemaker of Asuncion Ridge Vineyards. 
Uh, we've been downtown in Paso with our taste room for going on 12, 13 years. Uh, we're a small uh, family owned vineyard as well. We do 1,500 to 2,000 cases a year. Um, uh, we started off making uh, Pinot Noirs and then gradually moved um, from there doing uh, different blends and other varietals. We, our current releases are around nine different wines uh, uh, with um, Chardonnay and Pinot and then um, a bunch of different blends using both, both um, uh, Bordeaux and Rhone varietals and some Zinfandel as well. Um, I love this business. We've been, I've been in Pastoral now for uh, uh, just over 20 years. I uh, grew up in Southern California and uh, just uh, love this town. Yeah, cool. Right on. Thanks, Philip. Anita, tell us a little bit about yourself and your brand and, and everything. Everybody, thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Kathari, uh, owner and general manager of Copia Vineyards. Together with my husband, Verinder Sahi, we run a small boutique vineyard located on the west side of Paso Robles in the Willow Creek District. We have a tasting room uh, downtown. It's the topic of today. That's why I'm here. And uh, we make our wine over at Denner Vineyards. We're kind of in this interesting place right now where our vineyard um, is also going to be the site of a future winery and tasting room. Um, and, and at the current moment, we are uh, splitting our time between the tasting room and at Denner Vineyards where we make our wine. We source all of our grapes until our vineyard comes online in about three years time. Um, and they're all, all the grapes come from Paso Robles and Santa Barbara County. Uh, my husband, Verinder, is the winemaker and the two of us kind of wear a lot of hats and, and do a lot of things. We focus on Rhone varietals and a little bit of Bordeaux and happy to be here today. Cool, thank you so much, right on. I didn't realize that you were making your wines over at dinner. Uh, that's yeah. right on. That they've been uh, this uh, kind of hotbed of where a lot of brands have found their starts. Uh, all throughout uh, the region. And then, Philip, you're making your wines over at where? Is it? Over at Zanita. Yeah, okay, right here. great. Yeah. And we've been there since we started. 2005 was our first vintage. Okay. Uh, we did a show uh, on, uh, on that whole custom <laughs> type of roommates, if you will, thing where we had uh, Eric from Zaneda on as well as um, a couple of other uh, brands that used to make wines there, but then are, are making wines at other places. And so that was the topic of that show. Was, that was a pretty fun show. So back to our topic, though. Our topic is all about uh, downtown. If you've not been to downtown Paso uh, in some time, uh, you definitely need to come back and check it out. We've got a, a, just a, a large amount of tasting rooms and restaurants, boutique shops and the like that are just beautiful to discover and be able to kind of spend almost a day uh, just, you know, checking out to see what makes Paso so unique from our kind of downtown uh, perspective. All three of these brands have different, totally different storefronts because they're on different streets. They're probably seeing different clientele uh, and uh, they definitely have um, some uh, different uh, uh, marketing kind of uh, routines and campaigns, if you will. And, but I think what, probably comes down to having some commonality is, is why Paso downtown. Uh, I want to start with Philip because Philip, you started many years ago uh, in downtown and, and I'd love to hear from you. What, what made you pick downtown versus being maybe somewhere out on the wine trail or doing something different? Well, um, you know, we make wines at another winery. We don't have our own facility. Um, and when we first started making wines, uh, we still owned our property um, out in the Ascension Ranchos area of, of um, Atascadero, which is where our Pinot Vineyard, our Pinot Noir Vineyard was. Um, um, and that was just so far away from everything else that the idea of doing a taste room up there just didn't make any sense. So um, uh, when we were ready to open, we just started looking at different places um, and we just kind of really liked the downtown area. I think there were, there were a couple other wineries um, in town at that time. So it just seemed like a, a good fit. And, um, and so we, you know, we pulled the trigger and um, we haven't looked back. It's been, it's been a good run. Yeah, you were, you were with Bodegas, I believe, at the-, at the Yeah, when we, first, when we first started, we were with uh, Dorothy Shula over at Bodegas Paso Robles, which is over on 13th Street, almost in the same location 
that we are now on 12th. Mm -hmm. um, we were in that spot for oh, a couple of years um, and then decided to move out on our own and got a bigger space. It was a, it's a really tiny, tiny place. So as we started getting a little bit more well known, it just became too crowded to have two brands in such a small space. So now we're yeah. over on, on uh, 12th Street, right across the street from the park, 725, 12, um, in a nice large space, um, which is um, uh, nice, especially now uh, that we, we're, we're reopening um, after um, this uh, pandemic, because we have a lot of room and we can seat several different um, uh, groups in here and keep them, everyone um, really well distanced. So that it, having a nice big space is, has really come in handy over the last uh, few weeks. Yeah, I'm sure it has. It's a, and it is a great space right over there. What's the story with these little guys? Oh, we just started doing this recently. Um, uh, I call it a tasting to go. There, um, we have all of our wines, all of our current release wines, um, and then some wines that we just have for wine uh, club members also in these little uh, 50 milliliter bottles. Um, and we, we send those out. Uh, I put them in, in uh, either, you can either get a five or, or eight pack. Um, the eight pack includes our reserve wines. And uh, they come in a, um, a, a completely sealed airtight bag. And um, it's for people who either can't come to the taste room, want us to, to ship them to them wherever they are, or people that you know are are still feeling a little bit nervous about coming inside a building, they can pick up the tasting, take it across the street to the park, or you know back to their hotel or wherever, and, and taste it at their own leisure. I've I've also done um, um, some short little uh, YouTube videos on each of the wines, so uh, you can get uh, you can get the tasting and then join me for a tasting of each of the wines if you'd like to on, on YouTube. Cool. That's great. Um, I, I, I know that a few of our brands have been trying to do that. And so I didn't realize you were doing it as well. So that's a cool way to pivot during this uh, whole COVID thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's like really popular. We're selling them like crazy and they're just, I, I should get one. The bottles are like, they're adorable little bottles. They're just, like, they're just really, really cute. <laughs> right on. Uh, you know, we were, I, I should have uh, been telling everybody what we're having uh, today. So let me do that really quick. Um, and because normally everybody wants to know. And so for today, uh, Rosé of Pinot Noir uh, from Ascension Ridge. Although where's that fruit coming from? It, you said it used to come from. Uh, yeah, and I'm still, I, this is still from that vineyard. I, I'm still getting the fruit from that vineyard um, as through last year, this year. It's going to be all source Pinot, but it's a combination of Pinot from, from um, that, that vineyard, which is up at about 2,500 feet, like eight miles or so from Morro Bay. And then uh, uh, some from uh, the Hastings vineyard out by oh. in Adelaide district. And then yeah. um, some from uh, Jack Creek vineyard um, out there on 46 West in uh, Willow Creek district. Okay, cool. Then we also have a 2017, the story from Copia, that's 100% Grenache. And then from Indigene, we have a Sangio Malbec. What am I missing there, Ray? Merlot. Merlot, Merlot. right on. And we'll get into talking a little bit about uh, the wines here in uh, just a little bit. Uh, but I do want to maybe toss it over to Anita uh, because I noticed also for you, you're, you're doing something interesting. Please talk about uh, you know, basically what brought you to downtown and everything, but I love your tasting and, and everybody will see this in a minute, how uh, you have these little pre-poured uh, little pourers. So I'll put that up in a second. Yeah, so Copia, um, when we when we moved here, Verinder and I, at the end of 2017, Copia was already a brand um, that was pouring out of Paso Underground, which is this really cool little tucked away place in downtown Paso behind a, a women's clothing boutique. And we poured there for a little bit and we just felt very fortunate to be able to take over this uh, brand that had excellent wines made by the former owners, uh, Michael and Andrea. And, um, and then we kind of put our own spin on things. And as we grew into the brand and, and made it more our own, we moved to 840 13th Street um, and uh, 
what we started to do, honestly, we'd always wanted to focus on one-on-one -on -one appointment style tastings. Um, and we, you know, we're kind of forced in this situation, honestly, with the pandemic, where we had to be creative, just like, just like Philip with his oh so cute little bottles. They are very cute. Um, we came up with these cute little caress. <laughs> Um, so what, what we're trying to do is be copia and, and all that we embody, which is warm hospitality. My background is in restaurants, so it's very important to me, the tasting experience itself. And it's challenging when you're asked to stay, you know, six feet apart from your guests, the ones that you're supposed to be, you know, sort of anticipating their needs and taking care of them. So I, I thought back to uh, our restaurant days and uh, said, what can I do that's creative and still warm and inclusive and, and keeps people engaged? And we came up with these little carafes where for every two people, or if you're doing a solo tasting, uh, you have all of our wines lined up uh, in front of you in these little carafes and you can pour them yourself. Everything is obviously sanitized and safe, but we're not compromising sort of what we want to do and, and how we want to conduct um, ourselves in, in our tasting room. So it's been really successful. People love it. Um, number one, they feel safe, but we're not compromising anything about the warm hospitality that we've always offered. Plus, we're honestly, we're honestly spending some really, uh, I think, quality time with the folks that are coming in um, because we are, you know, sort of forced to take our time and accept less reservations. I think the only challenge is that we just don't have enough spots for the demand that we have. So we're, we're taking it day by day and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to adapt. Yeah, right on. That sounds great. I, I love those, that little lineup and I love how everybody is getting creative uh, with their, whether it be their wines and how they're presenting them or how they're still engaging with their customers or even how they're utilizing their space. Um, Ray, when I went to your place yesterday to help with this bottle exchange, I noticed you had some of those high tops out in the alleyway. And, and you have a very different spot too, where these two have storefronts on kind of two main thoroughfares. You're tucked away in a little alley, but you're also tucked away next to one of the most popular restaurants in Paso, Jeffrey's uh, Wine Country Barbecue. Have those high tops always been there? I mean, is that something that you did to pivot to be able to expand, go outside and provide a little space? Because you have maybe the tiniest tasting room out of the three here. Yeah, for sure. It's more of a kiosk style tasting room. Uh, the <laughs> high tops are new. There were tables there, but they were bigger. And I just put the high top because it's a smaller diameter and you can make sure you have six feet between couples. Um, also, we wanted to have a table that kind of brought attention and gave it the more Mediterranean style uh, uh, of winery that is in, tucked away in the alley, like you said, that's more inviting. Um, um, because it's such a small area, we do have just room for uh, uh, just a couple of couples, two couples at the bar and two outside. So everything is by appointment only. Um, but I like it because I could be able to spend a, a, a good amount of time with every book, with all the patrons and talk to them about the wines, take my time and talk to them about the history. Uh, I've been making wines, excuse me, in this area for 30 years. I've been literally out here working at wineries or bottling. My forte, how I started was in the bottling business. So I'm kind of a microcosm of a ton of winemakers from this area for the last 30 years. And I could not only talk in depth about my wines and wine styles, but about more of the history of Paso Robles, different winemakers, what their uh, perspectives are as far as the winery and the winemaking now compared to, you know, years back as far as 1989. So um, it's kind of like a, a new, new twist with the, with the tables and um, a different way to kind of bring some attention from you know both sides of the alley and um, a more intimate and, and unique flavor and taste experience. So Ray you say you've been here you've been uh, you know in the area for 30 years yeah you you know it maybe it's a little obvious your wineries up in Carmel Valley you source from all over right but you picked a very specific spot in downtown was that I mean 
that was intentional, but, wasn't it? But, so this is what I'm thinking. I mean, me being here for 30 years, I'm more of a, I'm, I, I look like a new winery, but I'm like the oldest guy in the business. I've been here forever. So I wanted to be able to have a place that was right up front so I could be able to kind of celebrate and continue to do business and have an experience with people that I've been in business with for the last 30 years. Uh, it just, just makes more sense to be part of Casa Robles' new progressive wine scene and uh, be able to participate in, in how this uh, small town that was, you know, back when I was there, it's just dirt and cows, how it's progressed into something a more of a powerhouse of the wine industry of California. Yeah, and for everybody watching, uh, when he talks about his his past and, and what he was doing, he was a bottler. He was basically one of those people out there that was one of those really important, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, ancillary businesses, if you will, that we cannot do without, which is bottles. I mean, literally, like, the person that's putting the wine in the bottle, right? Uh, and that's what Ray had been doing, not only here in Paso, but uh, up and down the Central Coast quite a bit. So he's, his wines come from a few different uh, areas from within the Central Coast and, of course, a few AVAs uh, within uh, Paso as well. Uh, the backgrounds that you guys have, Anita, you talked about being a restaurateur in the past. Where were you a restaurateur in the past and, and what drew you to Paso? Most of my time um, was spent in New York City. And I worked for a group called Myriad Restaurant Group. The restaurants that they managed, um, some, some, some are a little bit well-known in New York. Tribeca Grill, Nobu Restaurant Group, uh, Corton, which was a Michelin restaurant. And that was really sort of my um, wine education. That's how I caught the bug in terms of being a wine lover. Never pictured getting into the wine making side of the business at that point in time. Um, but that's where I got to interface with, uh, you know, world-class winemakers, sommeliers, wine directors, restaurateur, uh, Drew Nicorant that I worked for did a great job with allowing, um, allowing me to, to really have a hand in every part of the business. So it was an exciting time. And that's where I, I really caught the bug and love of wine. Before that, I uh, spent a lot of time in Chicago, which is my hometown, so far from Paso Robles. Uh, and I worked for Harry Carey's restaurant group also also heavily involved in, in planning wine dinners there among many other things. Um, and then Verinter, uh, my better half and the other half of Copia, his background is very interesting as well. Um, he was born in Punjab, India, and he came to North America like, you know, in his, uh, in his 20s. Uh, by way of Toronto, he moved to Indianapolis. He's had, I, we always joke that Copia is sort of his fourth career and my third career. So we're a little bit uh, late in the game too, Ray, but I, we're loving it. I mean, we're living our, what we call best life right now. He, um, in Punjab, uh, families there are agricultural. The culture is agricultural. So, you know, working with, with the land is sort of in his blood, but he hadn't done it for a very long time because he became a professional engineer and then later a real estate developer. He always wanted to kind of get back to the land and I have to give a lot of credit to him and the Sahi family because that's the whole reason why um, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of here in Paso because he had already started in the winemaking process or learning winemaking when we met and it all just kind of fell into place we had wine in common he was already seeking out properties to do it um, and then we found ourselves here in 2015 and again in 2016 when we both became the oldest harvest interns at Booker Vineyards. So, <laughs> you know, the dream kind of just evolved from, from there on. <laughs> and did Eric really put you to work? Yeah, he did. <laughs> he sure did. Uh, yeah, he, he did. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up because it, it kind of, we were, we were talking about this a little bit, all of us, yesterday. Um, about how, how interesting that what we have in common is that we're all located in downtown. We have another really cool thing in common and I feel really uh, the need to mention it. And that's that why, why, why Verinda and I are in Paso Robles um, is because it is such a welcoming community. It, it's number one, because we have the best wine. Uh, and number two, because this community welcomed us with open arms. And right here uh, on this panel is a very diverse group and kind of uh, speaks to that. 
And Eric, um, he could have looked at the both of us and, and said, no, nah, I don't really think so. You don't look like you can handle harvest at, at your ages. But he, and he did at first, by the way. But <laughs> I guess, <laughs> I kept, I, in, in, in the best possible way, he was, he was assuming, you know, ah, I don't know, it's hard work. You guys look like you're pretty established in your careers, but he gave us a shot. You know, he gave us a shot. He was open. He was, uh, he educated us with, with no qualms. There was no information kept from us. We literally had a hand in everything in 2016 mm -hmm. Booker Harvest and we'll forever be uh, grateful to him. And in fact, we still work with um, one of his main winemakers there, Pete Tyrone, he consults um, at Copia um, on, on the winemaking process. So yeah, big credit to them. They gave us a shot and we'll forever be grateful. I think it's so great that uh, you bring that up and, and, and it is interesting as to how wine takes you in so many interesting and, and different directions as far as you know, where your background was before, Verinders as well, and then it took you here to Paso. And then you found uh, uh, some good mentors, if you will, that uh, helped uh, guide you along the process. You know, Philip, you said earlier that you had uh, started uh, making your wine since the beginning over at Zaneda with uh, the Orbersolkas there, and they're just awesome people, well known in the community and so generous. Uh, and you've also, you know, had the ability to meet so many other different people, but your background in the in the industry here that have probably helped you along the way as well. But your background is really different. You said you came from Southern California. What brought you, what were you doing and what brought you, what, where did wine take you and, and into Paso? Well, I've had several lives, <laughs> um, professional lives. Um, I started out, my first career was in the music business. Um, I lived in Hawaii for a few years after I graduated high school in Southern California. Um, I did that, I was in the car business for several years. And then um, in real estate, um, which is where I, I met my business partner, Michael Dillsaver. Uh, he's a real estate broker and um, we worked together uh, down in the Pasadena, San Gabriel Valley area. And we both love wine. I've loved wine since I was really young um, um, from, from my teens. Um, I had friends that were older that started introducing me to wine you know, way back then. And um, when I was in my early 20s, I took a trip to Napa Valley um, and just fell in love with the whole culture. Um, the, just being in the vineyard and, and you know, meeting uh, uh, winemakers and the whole hospitality around winemaking and everything, um, um, I just fell in love with them. And so my, my, you know, from then my lifelong dream had been to you know, have a vineyard um, uh, and a bed and breakfast. Um, and so that was the first property that we bought here. Um, uh, Michael had also loved wine and we had taken some um, wine education classes uh, together. That's where we met um, and had, you know, several friends and, and um, the woman that ran those classes was a really um, big mentor of both of ours, um, Yvonne Rich. Um, I, I go as far as to mention her on, on our label, um, along with Mark Goldberg, because um, oh, wow. there are two people that are very, very instrumental in my life in the wine business. Uh, but when we, um, we bought our property here, our first property was in, we bought it in April of 2000 uh, with the intention of planting uh, grapes and running a bed and breakfast. Um, and I was here, I also have a cooking, a, a cooking background um, I've been cooking since I was a little kid. I've been to cooking school a couple of different times. So my plan was just to, you know, to have the vineyard, run the bed and breakfast and sell grapes and maybe do some catering and stuff like that on the side. Well, I was here for like two weeks and decided I needed to learn how to make wine. And, um, and that's, that's how I end up uh, meeting uh, Mark Goldberg over at Windward Vineyard. Mm -hmm. Um, be, since we were, because of our location, we were, we were going to plant Pinot and um, everyone said, well, if you're going to plant Pinot, you got to go meet Mark Goldberg because he's the Pinot guy in Paso Robles. So eventually um, I, I went and met him and became instant friends uh, with him and Maggie. And I ended up working for them for like three and a half, four years. And oh. that's where I learned how to make wine was, was work, working with, with Mark and Maggie. And then when it came time to uh, 
to uh, make our own wines, uh, there wasn't the room over at Windward. Otherwise, Mark would have let me do over there, make wine over there. But I just moved right around the corner over to uh, to Eric, and Eric was just uh, so gracious to to take us in. Um, uh, Dorothy from Bodegas Paso Robles was already making wines there, along with a few other people at that time. Um, and she convinced Eric to take us on. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is, you know, part of Eric's business and, and income. The first year we made wine with him, we crushed one ton of fruit. Um, and uh, we <laughs> made, 50 cases, <laughs> made 50 cases of Pinot Noir. Um, but we kept on growing, you know, uh, ever since then. But um, Eric also has just been, you know, a really great mentor and friend yeah. uh, to us. Um, along the way, um, it's, especially this past year, um, I had um, I had prostate cancer and had surgery for that uh, back in December. And um, Eric was just like really, really great with me, having to be gone um, for so long. He just really, really took care of me, and and for that I will always be grateful. Oh, right on, yeah. And you're you're good now, right? We talked about this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm cancer free. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to you. To Thank you. Thank right. you. Thank you. Hey, Ray, <clears throat> you weren't born a bottler. No. How did you get into bottling? Um, I moved to Paso in 89. Um, uh, I was a mass communications journalism major. Um, I looked to pick up a job to support myself while I was looking for work in the area. And uh, I found uh, Gary Cargill and Klaus Mathis at, at Art Sierra Winery, which is one of the old school wineries here. And uh, um, they took me in, taught me just about everything I knew about bottling. And I was a barrel guy. And it was a job that I knew nothing about. I had a background in working in the shipyards before. I was a night crew manager at Lucky Stores. And, you know, so it was more of a, a um, a, a transition of something new that I had no idea about. So I was really interested and, and um, uh, I kind of stuck with it. And a couple of years after that is what some investors came into town and they wanted to start a bottling business. Um, I left Archero and started working with these guys. I uh, eventually branched out on my own because there just wasn't enough bottlers in this area for the appetite of wine that was around. Uh, we didn't just bottle in Paso, it was all up and down the central coast, all up and down the coast of California. And back then, it literally was just Nils at Castor. And he was overworked. And um, so I did a couple of years with these guys, branched out on my own, and I was always kind of making wine as a bottler to be able to provide a better service, to be able to give you the image of me being a bottler was super know-how super knowing how to, to bottle wine from a winemaker's perspective. Um, and, and in these uh, years of making wine, I was always joining the, the amateur competitions and um, just kind of staying close to this fraternity of winemakers that were in this area. And I did that for 20, 25 years. And it, it, I started this winery in 2008. So I'm on my 12th vintage and um, it's been a great ride. And it just seems like everything that I've done has been a natural transition. And um, I'm enjoying myself immensely. And even though I've been in the business for almost 30 years, it seems like this is almost a new chapter. And it seems like it's gonna be um, a few more transitions in my life and I'm excited to see where this goes. So. Very cool, right on. Let's talk about wine, since we're talking about wine. Um, we've got this beautiful, delicious, crisp rosé of Pinot Noir from Ascension Ridge uh, coming up here. Philip, give us the one-two on this wine. 100% Pinot, huh? 100% Pinot, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a Pinot from Ascension. Um, we um, uh, crush the grapes and then let them sit overnight and then uh, pull off the juice uh, the following morning, and um, and then just uh, uh, you know go from there. Um, this one, this this rosé, I really love the way it came out. Um, 
I, I love the really light, uh, pretty salmon color. It's just a really, it's a really delicate wine. Um, it has a really, really nice mouthfeel. I think it's, it's, it's you know, it's a nice full body um, rosé um, for a rosé. Um, I, I like, you know, I just, I, I like the way it turned out. I, and I'd like to hear um, more about what you guys um, think of it and what your opinions and what you're, what you're smelling and tasting. Um, I'd rather hear that than from myself. Philip, I love it. Um, this is like what, uh, personally, what I would want a rosé to be. It's light. It's got this, um, it's got this really kind of an amazing floral note to it, too, that I enjoy. And pinots are, you know, we at Copia have not yet attempted a uh, pinot, maybe in the future, because it is one of my personal uh, favorite varietals, and I love burgundy and wine. Um, th this is kind of what you want in a Pinot. It, the aromas aren't muted. It's doing all the things that a Pinot should do. So congratulations, it's a great wine. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I love this wine too. Um, I have a bigger Pinot background because one of the wineries I bottled for was Byron Winery and Ken Brown, who's like the Pinot aficionado. I learned a ton about um, Pinot Noir from him. And what I didn't have a big background uh, and was Pinot Rosé. Um, I like this color. The flavor profiles are solid. Uh, it has this crisp melon character and just enough bright acid to make the flavor profiles pop. Um, this emulates exactly Pinot varietal character, even in a Rosé. And I think you did a great job. Thank you. Thanks. Philip, it's delicious. And thank you so much for sharing it. I really appreciate it. So Absolutely. Uh, a, a large lineup of wines, and, and if we uh, definitely a lot of skews, you can see a bunch of them behind you there. Uh, at the end here, we'll we'll talk. We'll try to run through some of the flagship wines for everybody, uh, if time permits. Um, we have this really well. I love this label, by the way. I mean, that is that's a, that's a really nice label. Did you design that? Because that's the um. So we work really with great elegance on this worked with a local artist and it's a cool story behind the uh it's called the story number one it's called the story um mm -hmm. and uh we worked with local designer sierra christensen she also works over at saxon vineyards and pretty much begged her to do our labels for the 2017 vintage um verinder and i had just come back from a trip to india which is uh it's it happens to be where both of us are from um my parents and, and him and uh we were inspired by the textiles and, and music and just the sights that we saw during that trip. It was kind of a month long immersion trip, also a family wedding. So all of this was really fresh in our minds. And the story label in particular, it's hard to see, but you'll probably be able to see it on our website a little bit better. Um, it's kind of a blind embossed of a textile that's very traditional um, in, in Rajasthan, in that area of India. So it's, uh, just little pieces of our heritage that go into everything. Um, this, this wine is mostly Grenache. It's actually not 100% Grenache, it's mostly Grenache, 83%, um, okay. with just a touch of Syrah blended in. What, what we try to do with all of our wines is try to achieve this, this balance. We don't want to go far from the varietal characteristic. So this is most definitely a Grenache when you drink it. And it's very classic Paso Grenache. So this is all from the Willow Creek District, several vineyards in the Willow Creek District, which is uh, west, west side of uh, Paso. And it's got that berry tart kind of bright red character. It's a concentrated wine though too, and that touch of Syrah really helps to lend some structure to it. So hope you guys enjoy. Cheers. Oh, delicious. Cheers. Thank you so much. This is yeah, this is, this is fabulous. I really like this wine a lot. I, it's got a great nose, and you're right. I, I like just that little touch of Syrah adds um, a, a nice little backbone and, and some depth to it, but it doesn't take away at all from, from the, the characteristic of the Grenache at all. Uh, uh, really nice acidity. I really, this is lovely. Thank you, thank you. And we're also pretty restrained on the on the oak with this one. It's 80% um, once used. So, you know, it's, there's no new oak on this on this wine, which also helps to preserve that lively character that Grenache can present. Yeah. Oh, it's, All right. it's, yeah, I think this is big Grenache fruit and 
it too kind of it's bright and and it exudes the varietal character of Pernas. Uh, it's a beautiful wine. It's light, not overpowering. Um, I'm surprised how much fruit you got out of this with uh, uh, Casa Robles, which is more of a warm climate area. Um, it's balanced. It's good and fleshy on the mouthfeel. And I think it's a great wine. And, and in the Grenache area, where I don't have a lot of experience, this is what I would be trying to make if I was a Grenache winemaker, for sure. So cheers. Okay. Right. Where did, so where did you, it's Willow Creek District, but is there a specific? It's Willow Creek and there's uh, several vineyards, but I can name a few that we source from. So Denner, where we make our wine, we source from them. Sure. We source from uh, Jada, a little bit from Epic in the past. Um, and then uh, for this vintage, we also have some Santa Barbara fruit. So we'll call out White Hawk Vineyard for the Syrah. Um, so this, this one's all Willow Creek, but in 2017, these are some of the sites that we sourced from. And uh, we continue to kind of find sites, develop our own styles, and we always love to blend different vineyards together. Although something down the, down the pike in, at Copia for the 2019 vintage, we did find three excellent sites that we're gonna do single um, vineyard designate Syrahs for. Okay. And I say Syrah a lot because it's Verinder's favorite varietal. Like he'll put Syrah in everything if he could. Yeah. Uh, somebody was asking again what one one more time what wine it is, and so it's the 2017 the story um, with mostly Grenache with a little bit of Syrah. In it. So, and that's great. All three of you actually play with a little bit of fruit from technically out of the Paso ABA and uh, and make some absolutely delicious wines. I uh, can't wait to get into this one now. Uh, with, with Ray. Ray, your label, that's a story. That's got to be a story right there. That is so interesting and cool. Uh, you know, everything with me is grassroots. Mm -hmm. and, and literally, uh, the indigenous label before was like three tones, an uh, inner, inner dancing couple, and a kind of um, made a, a reference to balance and neutrality. And at that time is when we were first started at the winery and I was still bobbling at the same time. And my kid, my daughter was four years old at that time. And one night she just told me, hey, you know, that's all you think about is grapes and wine. And that's all that's in your head. And we wrote it out in crayon and a buddy of mine's made a digital picture of it. And that's what he came out with. And no I kidding. Made it my label. Yeah. And even though it's not exploitation, it's free. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was just an idea that um, my kid just made a reference to at one time, and I made it a label. Yeah. So, uh, um, that's it, cool. It, it, uh, so, it, let's talk about uh, Biante. Uh, it's, a, it's a blend. Uh, so, right. talk about it. It's a blend of 56 Sanja Vese, 25 Malbec, and 19 Merlot. And Back then, when I first started making this wine, one, everybody was doing the traditional Super Tuscan, which was, you know, uh, crushed Sangiovese, take out 10 to 20% of the juice, Sennier, and then add 10 to 20% ca Cabernet and call it a Super Tuscan. Well, I, um, learning from five or six guys who were really ins inspirational in my winemaking career, decided to make the Sangiovese a full varietal, to make Melbet, to add to it, to give it more flesh, and Merlot to keep that chalky tannic finish. Um, I want to make the wine big and bright. That Sangiovese in the Paso Robles area is always big and chalky and overpowering. The Melbet was able to balance it out and bring a smooth transition from bright fruit to fleshy mid palate, and then the Merlot, another smooth transition to add a chalky, sprinkly tannin finish. Um, the name Aviante was for five guys who were, like I said, were really influential in my winemaking career, and every one of those guys did something that was really unique that only they did in their winemaking process, and I was able to do every one of those things in this blend and Aviante translated in Italian as entourage. So it was more like an homage to these guys who 
you know, really helped me out in my career at a young part of my winemaking uh, uh, process. So, and there you have it, the Aviante blend. Excellent. Yeah. It's very cool. It's like, um, it's all cherry and strawberry and it's got this racing acid, which I love. So this, I, I love this and it's kind of perfect for today's weather too. Yeah, I really like this a lot too, too Ray. I love, I love how you integrated um, uh, their Merlot and Malbec in here. It, it just, you're right, it sets off that kind of a dusty, chalky little tannin on the end there that it's really, it's like a super, super Tuscan. I, 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 um, I, I love what it's doing in my mouth. <laughs> on i think they it, so i'm looking at it and yours is a 2016 by the way the 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 story is 17 of course ascension ridge uh and uh being a pinot rose is a 19 but the 16 was the last year i guess you could say of the drought in paso and so you're looking at fruit that's going to be really concentrated that's been stressed out plants mm -hmm. that have been stressed out over a five-year drought and, uh, and so the spiciness quality of this wine and, and the concentrated, but not overly, not reductive concentration, but just this, this super intensity that it has and tension that it has is, is delicious. And thank you very much. This is, this is excellent. All right, cheers. 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 Hmm. 17 actually was when we came pretty much out of the drought because we had a pretty intense year um, for a lot of water, of course, coming back around. But then we also had uh, some interesting uh, weather events uh, that, uh, that with some heat anyway, that really actually, if anything, helped with Grenache. Grenache, it, it likes heat. Um, but it can also not like heat, uh, and then Syrah with heat goes black pepper, but Syrah with less heat goes white pepper. Um, the balance of this wine in particular is, is, is pretty great, and uh, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a delicious wine. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, but. Just, just that um, I'm, I'm happy that at Copia we get to do this we get to play around with blends it's part of what another reason why we're we're drawn to paso because so many people are doing these amazing rhone style blends um and and before 20 you know in in uh, new york when i was at tribeca grill we actually had a focus on rhone wines little did i know it would it would bring me here later but it's always been a big part of uh of my wine palette so I love, um, I love this bright character of Grenache, the structure and the pepper quality and sometimes the blue fruit of Syrah, depending on where you source it from. So like you said, in terms of weather and, and where you choose it, it our, our wines are always a product of, of sight, you know? And it's fun to play around, no year, as we are learning now, we're, we're on the newer side, but as we're learning, no year is the same. I can, uh, 2019 is sort of fresh in my mind, as is 2018. Speaking of bottling, Ray, we just went through a bottling two days ago. So glad to be done with that. Uh, it's, n I don't know how you did it, honestly. I do not know how you did it today. After I look at the, the bottling folks who are just kind of like salt of the earth people, the, what they have to deal with. And we're stressed out, but they were really, really cool. Um, and, and so 2018 and 2019, we, we, we start to play with sight a little bit more at Copia as, as we're growing. And I can say that we have some beautiful expressions of a cool climate versus warm climate, and then we're putting it together in, in some regard. So 2019 in particular, you're gonna see some single bottlings of cool climate, warm climate, and then, and then the blends, which we consider our sort of perfect balance. So we really enjoy uh, doing the blending and we really just, we make wine that we enjoy drinking and hope, you know, at least one other person does too. <laughs> uh, the Pinot Rosé is a testament to the fact that we can grow and create a lot of different wines in Paso uh, because Pinot, I don't think is what you would off the bat consider something from Paso because everybody considers Paso too hot, but we're actually cooler than you think, um, pun intended. And so, <laughs> <laughs> The, but uh, 
th this Pinot, it's just so fresh and lovely. And so thank you so much for, for sharing it. We, had, we grow 64 uh, different varieties in Paso. So we, we can get a lot of stuff uh, just right. And so this is delicious and thank you. Um, one more thing, uh, speaking to that whole bottling thing, you know, so I've seen winemakers in their time of bottling and that is absolutely the most stressed out that they ever are, truly. They, I mean, I, I don't, like, that is it. That's, that right there is, I mean, even more so than harvest. Ray, how did you deal with, and it's probably like bridezillas or something, right? I mean, that's. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I think I just like the idea of being somewhere different every three days. It, you know, it was a different experience. And I think that I had a personal relationship with most winemakers. The first year, it was always stressful. But after that, you kind of get to know these guys. and You know what they like and what they don't like. You know that they're going to be stressed, period. You know, after 30 years of bottling, when I bottle, I'm stressed. You know, even right now. So if you kind of know what these guys are going to expect. You know what they don't expect. You know what's going to make them happy. And, um, um, it's more of a learning process. So it, it's kind of like, like controlling children, you know, in a sense. You already come in, already prepared for what they're going to want, and you already have your machine capable of doing what they need and let them know that they're commanding everything and you have everything under control. So it's just more of a psychological game than anything. And bottling always turns out good. And, and I wouldn't have changed my life any way than, than exactly the way it went. So. Yeah, right on. All right, round robin, we're getting over uh, towards the end of our time together. I want a quick little, what's the best thing about uh, a tasting room in Paso? What it, be it doing business, be it your customers, be it where they're coming from, all that. Let's start with Anita, Anita. Best thing about being in Paso and downtown Paso specifically, yes. you're, you're kind of like, at the crossroads, you know, you're you're where people eat, where they stay, where they shop, and where they taste wine. And anyone can spend maybe two, three hours walking around downtown Paso to see the true character uh, of Paso Robles, whether it be the shop owners or the restaurateurs. And I bet you, you know, two, three shops that you go into, whether it be a winery, restaurant, or or um, or, or a retail shop, you're going to see the owner there. That's cool. That's different. You know, that's that's much different than some of the other wine tasting regions. We are we are strong in terms of the quality of our wine, the diversity of our wine, and the number of wineries now that we have in Paso. But you're still going to get this very cool small town feel, but at a higher level. So that's very unique, and that's why we're in downtown and feel fortunate to be there. Cool, Philip. Your your why why pass why downtown Paso, why should no I, it's I just I love being down here for a lot of the reasons that Anita uh, just talked about. Um, we we have great customers. Um, we have a, a great base of, of of wine club members now. Um, and and you know what? Eventually, when people come to visit Paso, they almost all end up downtown. Uh, they're either coming to go to the shops or to a restaurant or to other tasting rooms. So we see so many people. Um, uh, we're open a little bit later than most wineries are also. So um, uh, we get a, a big group of people that are either come either right before dinner or just after to have a, another glass of wine or to do a tasting. But the nice thing is since we're downtown, we also see a lot of our friends here too. We see, you know, other winemakers and people in the industry, as they come into town, um, you know, at the, to have dinner or something, um, a lot of them stop in and um, have a glass of wine. It's nice to be able to catch up with them. Um, we, um, we have um, two vacation rentals on our property too. So, so those people always end up um, downtown um, uh, in the taste room as well. So it just, it just works out nice. It's a great, it's a great collection of, of, um, of people that stop by and, and taste our wine and just um, uh, come in just to chat. Right on. Ray, best thing about uh, having your tasting room in Paso and clients and everything else? 
downtown. The thing for me um, is I, I walk in the door expecting to meet really cool people who are having a great time, who have a good expectation, but they're they're just uh, usually loving couples who are just on vacation and having a great time, wanting to experience some great wines, and who are always in a good mood, and that's good for me. Good for them is that we're the designated hitters. I mean, Paso's 300 crazy good wine and crazy good winemakers, you know, they, they're they places all over Paso, which you know more than everybody, who have wines that are unique, beautiful, and that are destinations. But at nighttime in the downtown, we hit it out the park. We are the last of the, the, the image of Paso Robles and when you come down and you have a great dinner and you want to have one more taste of some wines, we get to exhibit the depth and the, the, the great parts of Paso Robles that a lot of other wineries don't, don't have. So I like the idea of uh, being one of the last impressions that you're going to get. And I try to knock it out the park. <laughs> right on. <laughs> hey, uh, so one of the things uh, that's happening in the downtown right now. And I encourage you, everybody watching, to go to PasoWine.com uh, to see what's happening uh, right now in downtown. We have a new downtown dining experience, as it's called. Uh, there's lots of links on PasoWine.com that you can see how restaurants are starting to try to incorporate portions of the downtown for this kind of takeout dining option. Um, so please go check that out. I don't know about you guys. What do you guys think about that? I mean, do you think it's going to help bring some business into downtown and uh, back in and, and help uh, spread people out so they're, uh, you know, socially distanced and the like? I think it's great. I, I think it's great to offer just yet another option for people to come and safely enjoy all the wonderful restaurants that we have in downtown Paso. Um, and, and in turn, I think that also offers us all the opportunity to, to display our wines to those same people that are coming downtown. So I think it's great. It's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, it's cool that they're also allowing uh, you to actually, when you're sitting in this designated area in the downtown park, that you can actually share a bottle of wine with your table, right. your, the people that you're with, of course. Uh, and, and that they've, they've allowed these ABC laws to, to be able to do that. Uh, so I don't know, Ray, Phil, if you guys got anything to say about that? Yeah, no, I think it's a great idea. It's, I, I, I can see it, the area from, from our tasting room. So um, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's picking up steam. Um, it's, it's only been going on for a little while, but I think um, every weekend it gets more and more popular, um, especially for people that, are, that, that um, are still a little nervous about going inside of, of a restaurant and stuff they can you can come and have the, the downtown experience, um, get a bottle of wine, get a meal and sit in the park. And, and those, all those, those tables and everything over there, are, they did a really nice job setting it up. They're all really distanced really well. So people can go in there and feel really safe about, about being out um, and, and having you know, a fun time in public. Yeah, yeah. right. And here, I just think that it's uh, giving people uh, perspective of safety and being able to go out and dine and being outside where the air is moving around a little bit more. It's, uh, it's, it's not like being inside of a restaurant. It's, it's uh, the same experience of casseroles. And uh, I think a lot of the local people need that. And, and what it's doing is getting a lot more people who are in this area out and have them to continue to be able to enjoy the great restaurants around this area and, and be able to have a good time um, um, in an alternative way, you know, so it's just part of Paso Robles progression. These guys come up with something every time you turn around. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it and probably a really good way to end it too is we're always trying to diversify ourselves. We're always trying to kind of see how we can meet the needs of our fans and our customers and, and those people that are just uh, you know, so into us as Paso Wine. And so thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to Ray, Phil, uh, Anita, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for being on the show today on the Zoom Hangout. Uh, next week, we'll have another Zoom Hangout. Check out PasoWine.com Thursday uh, at 3 o'clock again. And uh, we'll be having another neat group coming together uh, since it's been a few uh, many shows, actually, since 
we've seen what's been happening in the vineyard, we have another group that's gonna come together and talk about what's happening in their vineyards. And it'll be covering the Adelaide District, Willow Creek, uh, and uh, I think it's the El Pomar district. That's the other one. So looking forward to that show, PasoWine.com. Check it out. Thank you again to my panelists. Cheers, you guys. Cheers. 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 Thanks. Thanks for hosting us. Mm. Right on. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Anita. Bye, Ray. Bye-bye.